army of Yahweh. Brother Lucas? We'll just chalk it up to growing pains, right? So, you all bow with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We praise you and thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day, the gathering of brothers and sisters here together. We just thank you so much for the opportunity, the blessings you give us. We thank you for all of those fellowshipping with us online. And we know it's hard to be out by themselves, Father. And we pray that you just let this be a, uh, a blessing to them. And we praise you and thank you so much for all things, Father. And please guide my words here today, Father, that they may make an impact on somebody today. And uh, let them see the glory of you today. In Yeshua's name, hallelujah. Shout out to Ryan for making such a cool graphic for me, by the way. Um, one of the things I wanted to... I haven't made it a secret that I really appreciate the uh, minor prophets. And um, I already did a message on uh, Jose a while back called The Sorrow of Yahweh. And there's a couple things I wanted to address concerning the minor prophets. And the first thing I want to address is, first of all, I don't think they're minor at all. But when we look at the Bible, we spend a lot of time going back and forth uh, between the beautiful Genesis and the mysterious uh, future-based uh, revelation or the story of Moses in Exodus and the work of the Messiah throughout his evangel. It's amazing to me. I mean, ju just this morning, we've already read the Torah and we've already read the evangel. Hallelujah, praise Yahweh. They're all wonderful. But today I'm going to focus on the small section that lies in between. And I'm going to start, I'm going to call it a series but I'm going to start speaking on the minor prophets, and I'm going to dedicate a sermon to each one. Now, some are longer than others. Like Joel, for example, is only three chapters. I was always under the impression it was a lot longer than that. But um, I'm a, this, this is what most people call flyover country. You know, they, they go from the old to the new, and they never really stop in the middle. And I want to take a few minutes to kind of unpack that. And... Uh, like I said, I did a sermon on Hosea a while back, and I, I really enjoyed it. I got a lot out of it, and I pray that you guys did too. But I want to I touch on something first. Why do we call them minor prophets? Let's, let's look at a few definitions. I, I love definitions of words. I find language very interesting and telling. The first thing is the word minor, lesser in importance, seriousness, or significance. Minor alterations, slight, small, unimportant, insignificant, and inconsequential. Now, I think we could all agree that doesn't fit, right? Well, what about a prophet? A person regarded as inspired teacher or proclaimer of the will of Elohim, a seer, prophesier, prophetess, or an oracle. Now, I got to tell you, I think these are counter to one another. You can't have somebody that is an inspired proclaimer of, of Yahweh and have them be inconsequential. That's just not, a, it's not possible. I think it, it's, again, it's not that we shouldn't call them minor prophets because compared to others' prophets, they are small in size. But I don't think that we should let their message become minor in our lives because they hold a lot of information, a lot of information that is relevant and important for us today. Um, so let's, obviously these aren't minor prophets. We're, they're just dedicated that by man in our infinite wisdom. So now that we can understand that uh, they are not minor, they are important, we can uh, move on. I want to start at the, I'll say the beginning, but I've already covered Hosea, so it's not technically the beginning. But the ones that I've covered, it's the beginning. So, who was Joel? Well, his name means Yazel. And there's nothing really known of the history of Joel beyond what his name means and who his father was. Um, it says his name was Peth Pethuel or Bethuel, depends on the translation you read. So if we don't know who he was, we can talk about what he said. The book of Joel is broken down into three chapters. And again, I always thought this was longer. We will go over each chapter and its significance and the impact on ancient Israel and even for future events. So chapter one, locusts, lots of locusts. Sometime during Joel's ministry, Judah was struck by a terrible, terrible locust plague. 
more intense than ever experienced prior to that, according to what's written and how it's expressed. And he compares this locust plague to the day of Yahweh. And chapter 1 describes this plague in, honestly, quite stark detail. For example, verses 1 through 4. I'll put it up on screen here. Hear this, you elders. Give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. So there's just nothing left, I think, is what it's trying to get across. There's nothing left. Down in verse 12, you can see it says, The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, and the palm tree, and also the apple tree. And even all the trees of the field were withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. The livestock were, the livestock were not even, uh, they were languishing right along with the men. So what does Joel advise be done about this? What does he suggest? I mean, you've got this locust plague. What can you do, right? In verses 13 through 14, he says, Gird yourselves, lament, ye priests, howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my Elohim, for the meat offering and the drink offering, which is a holden from the house of your Elohim. Sanctify ye a fast and call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of Yahweh your Elohim and cry unto Yahweh. Alas for the day, for the day of Yahweh is at hand, and as destruction from the Almighty, it shall come. So Israel's smack dab in the middle of this locust plague, and the day of Yahweh hasn't even arrived yet. I don't know how many of you noticed that, but he's talking about the day of Yahweh is at hand, like it's the locusts were already here. Everything was it's already being consumed right in front of them, and the day of Yahweh hadn't even arrived yet. So what what could this possibly be? Well, Joel is using this plague that is at hand to prophesy to those, the children's children's children that he spoke of earlier, which includes us today. The locusts in chapter 1 are a shadow of things to come. Now, chapter 2 gets a little bit more into the day of Yahweh. Chapter 2 is types and shadows. He describes, he goes on to explain that the locust plague is parallel to the great and terrible day of Yahweh that is yet to come. So imagine being wrapped up in this situation where you've got millions of locusts, locusts all around you, eating everything, and you find out that this isn't even as bad as it's going to get. <laughs> I couldn't imagine. He goes on to describe these things in um, amazing detail. Verse, chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. A day of darkness and of gloominess a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains a great people and strong, and a strong there hath not ever been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. And that's amazing to me. I don't know if any of you have ever looked at what happens. They just had a swarm in Africa just not too long ago. And a couple of years ago, they had a swarm in Las Vegas of all places. And you can look it up online. I mean, it's just like it looks like a fog on the land. It's incredible. I don't think people appreciate how destructive a locust can be. They'll, they'll swarm on something, and once they've eaten everything, they'll turn on each other, and they'll go cannibal, and they'll just kill themselves. And... The whole thing is just very, very fascinating. So I'm going to go over a couple things, like what would it be like to be in this situation? Well, it says in verse 5, Like the noise of chariots on the tops of the mountains, shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as strong people set in battle array. So obviously this is, this is talking about these locusts like they're soldiers. They're soldiers, well, in a way they are. They're, they're an army of sorts set out to accomplish Yahweh's will. Now, locusts, oftentimes, what we call a locust in the United States is not a locust. 
The cicadas that you hear in the summertime, that's not a locust. That's a cicada. They're two vastly different things. I always thought they were locusts as a, as a child growing up, but they're not. Cicadas, believe me, these people would have probably rather had cicadas around than locusts. Cicadas make a lot of noise. They're kind of annoying, but they're not nearly as destructive as a locust. And a locust is just a type of grasshopper, really. And, you know, one or two is not a problem. But if you've got a million of them, or 10 million of them, or 20 million of them, you know, that's going to sound, the noise, imagine that noise, the fluttering of their wings and things like that. Now, there can be as many as 80 million locusts in the average swarm. That's the average swarm. It's like, oh, hey, there was a swarm of locusts. You expect there to be around 80 million of these bugs in this swarm. I mean, imagine what that would sound like. I mean, everybody, you probably in the summertime had a grasshopper flutter by. <laughs> imagine having 80 million of them things flying around. It would probably be deafening. There was a website I found called farmprogress.com, and it goes into detail about some of these swarms that have happened. And one in particular in the 1800s comes to mind, and it is mind-blowing. Again, they're not as loud as cicadas, but they are far more destructive, and the average locust swarm consists of 80 million locusts. However, that's not the largest, not by a long shot. This, again, farmprogress.com, it's, it's an article called Locust Swarms Bring Back the Past for U.S. Farmers, and it's a fascinating read if you get a chance to read it. It says, the density of the Rocky Mountain locust swarms that periodically hit the U.S. crop fields during the 1800s is difficult to grasp today. Western settler accounts testify to locust clouds blocking out the sun, just like it talks about in scripture. Laura Ingalls Wilder wrote, the cloud was hailing grasshoppers. The cloud was grasshoppers. Their bodies hid the sun and made darkness. Their thin, large wings gleamed and glittered. The rasping and whirring of their wings filled the whole air, and they hit the ground and the noise with the noise of a hailstorm. Now, that's amazing. I praise Yahweh I've never had to live through that. I don't even want a, one grasshopper crawling on me, let alone all these. Now, how many were in these swarms that we, that we uh, have record of in the United States? There's some absolutely amazing descriptions here, and one's especially kind of funny. It says, within the span of, a sh of, of hours, locust swarms could blow in and devour everything a farmer had. Total consumption, crops, fabric, clothing. Farmers tried in vain to fight the swarms with fires and metal scoops covered with tar and molasses <clears throat> and were met with the destruction on a catastrophic scale. As Wild West Magazine details, quote, the locusts soon scoured the fields of crops, the trees of leaves, every blade of grass, the wool off the sheep, the harnesses off the horses, the paint off the wagons, and the handles off the pitchforks. The locust, the farmer grimly quipped, ate everything but the mortgage. <laughs> I mean, imagine that. You have a shovel sitting outside, and all of a sudden it doesn't have a handle anymore because these bugs ate everything. The destruction was absolute, complete and total annihilation of everything. The clothes, you have clothes out on the line? Not anymore. They're gone. The sheep got sheared by the locusts. I mean, that's, that is amazing to me. There... I think it's easy to look at something like what Joel says here, these, these locusts, you know, oh, a plague of locusts. You think about how bad could it possibly be? Well, I think we can look through history like this here, and we can see that Yahweh sending something like this on even us today would devastate, completely devastate what we know and what we have. I don't, I don't think we really get it. That, you know, no matter how far we advance, Yahweh can use something as simple as a grasshopper to bring us to our knees, and it wouldn't take nothing. I think it's amazing. Now, how big was, now we've talked about what they can do. How big was this swarm recorded? In 1875, five, the largest locust swarm in history was recorded over the Midwest, 198,000 square miles. That's bigger than the state of California. That is a massive, I mean, think about that. You drive a thousand miles north to south and still be covered in these bugs. It says that 1875 swarm was estimated to contain several trillion locusts and probably weighed several million tons. 
That was the largest locust cloud in world history. Now, obviously, this is just recorded, what we know of, but this is the largest one ever recorded, according to Jeffrey Lockwood, author of The Devastating Rise and Mysterious Disappearance of Insects That Shaped the American Frontier. They have locust swarms today that they turn up on radar. I mean, that should be just mind-blowing in and of itself, but imagine being in such a situation where... 198,000 miles is just completely devastated. Completely devastated. I, I, I don't think that with the infrastructure that we have today, with all the modern advances we have today, I don't think we'd come back from it if it happened today. There's too many people. There's too many people reliant on, on what we have. And imagine, you know, locusts, they've been around for a long time. Now you have somewhere small like Judah. Judah's not as big as the United States. So imagine you've got a locust swarm. Let's say it was the minimum of 80 million. Imagine the effect that would have on local communities, on the people, on every single aspect of your life. It would, everything would come to a standstill. They say that these locusts will swarm, and when they, when they latch onto something and they, they take it out, it literally looks like a bomb went off, like there's nothing left. Dirt is just, that's it, it's just dirt. And so why, why is this... We've got the size. We can see what they do. You've got over several trillion locusts flying around, or millions or billions, or whatever the number may be. Five is too many for me. You have all this, but what makes them so destructive is their unity and purpose. It's almost like they're receiving marching orders. And it says in, it says in uh, Joel 2, in, cha in chapter 2, verse, let me see here. Uh, verse 7, they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. It says they run to and fro in the city. They shall run up on the wall, and they shall climb up upon the houses, and they shall enter in at the windows like a thief. Yahweh uses something, again, Consider the ant. That's one of my favorite scriptures. Consider the ant, you sluggard. And when you look at something like a locust, something as simple and honestly, in the, probably as far back on the, in the back of our minds as something could be, how something could come immediately to the forefront of everybody's life. And I think, you know, stuff like this, stuff like this, it's, it's commonplace in Old Testament. And, you know, you think it's so far away from what it could possibly be for us. It's just one of those things where Yahweh uses what he will use in a way that nobody ever sees coming. And again, no matter what you try to do in a situation like this, you had the farmers putting out shovels covered with molasses to try to stick them in like a little fly trap. I mean, you want to talk about futility. Imagine having a fly trap with 12 trillion flies. I mean, it's just ridiculous. There's only so much you can do. And imagine this, it says, like we had the quote from Laura Ingalls Wilder, said it blocked out the sun. It says the earth will quake and the sun will cease to shine. I know it sounds poetic, but I think this is literal. This is literally happening to these people. The sun went dark. I mean, we have an account, for, historic account of people in these swarms where it says all you could see was the gleaming of their wings. I mean, that would be, I couldn't imagine the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars will withdraw their shining. I mean, talk about chaos. I mean, back then, you'd have, you, your population was so much smaller, but now imagine trying to navigate the city streets if you've got a town with a population of more than a couple thousand. Imagine being in one of these big cities with one of these swarms hitting. I mean, it would be a nightmare. I couldn't imagine. So we have lots of locusts, and we have complete and total destruction laid out before us. We know that Yahweh will not accept the sins of Israel, nor the rebellion of man today. So what do you do? What can you do? Over in verse chapter 2, verse 12 through 16. Therefore also now saith Yahweh, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. 
excuse me. Getting over a cold. And rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto Yahweh your Elohim for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him from evil, uh, from, uh, repenteth him of the evil. Now, I, there's something here in verse 13 I want to touch on. Rend your hearts and not your garments. He doesn't care about an outward expression of regret. You know, that, that, anybody can do that. He wants you to rend your heart. He wants you to change who, who you are, what is causing the rebellion and the sin in your heart to begin with. That's what he wants us to address. Not the, not the surface level that we see on the, in the world. And, and think, a good analogy, I think, is, you know, we're told to be charitable. We're told to be loving to our brother, to, you know, give the shirt off your back if you have to. But anymore, it's a very popular thing to see online. You see these guys walking up to, a, let's say, a homeless person, for example, and they have nothing. And they walk up and they record themselves giving this person money or a car or whatever, or even food, whatever it is. But they record themselves and then they put that on, on online and then the praise and the, oh, hallelujah, this is such wonderful. And don't get me wrong, the homeless person was blessed either way. However, if you look at it from a scriptural standpoint, point, that's, not, that's not from the heart. That's the rending of the garments. Yahweh wants a complete and broken individual from the inside out. He doesn't need somebody that's broken from the outside in. That, those, those are a dime a dozen. You have, I know people personally that suffer. And, and the only way they know how to cope is, honestly, it seems like they're you know, seeking attention. And it's the wrong type. It's the wrong way to go about it. Next. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? even a meat offering and a drink offering unto Yahweh our Elohim. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, and call a solemn assembly. Gather together the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. So what do we do to avoid, not necessarily a physical swarm of locusts, but the judgment of Yahweh in general? To make yourself ready. Make yourself ready, just like we're told to many other times in Scripture. Gather together the people. Call a solemn assembly. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. How do you do those things? What, what are we doing here today? We're gathered together. You know what I mean? We've got so many, we have so many opportunities to do what is written here. Most people ask, well, what can we do? I think we do what we're doing. We follow Yahweh's word. We follow his commandments and make ourselves ready as the bridegroom and the, and the bride. That's, that, that's our only option is to make ourselves ready for that day because it, it'll come. And like scripture says, it'll be like a thief in the night. So you have to do your best to make yourself ready. Now, Joel 2, chapter 28. Actually, hang on a minute. Return, return to Yahweh. I know there used to be a song we used to sing um, years ago. And it was, you know, return to Yahweh. And that's all he wants. That's all he requires of us is just return to him. Look at the absolute destruction in verses 1 through 11. And from 12 onward, read it together. Read chapters, chapter 2, 1 through 11, and then read verse 12 to the end of the chapter. And it's, it's night and day difference. You have this just woe, you have darkness, you have destruction, you have complete and total annihilation of everything. And then from verse 12, you have redemption. You have a, a beautiful story of redemption. You can get a real sense of panic and unrest from the first half and calm and a warm, loving feeling from the latter half. Joel was an excellent writer, to be sure. A lot of times, a lot of scripture comes off as kind of dry, and um, or in Ezekiel's case, it just comes off as this, what is happening. But Joel was a very good writer. He, and even the translators were able to carry a lot of that over. And I think he was blessed in that way. I think he was a blessed writer. And I think he um, was able to communicate his emotions and the emotion that Yahweh wanted to communicate very well in his, in his words. Now, um, Blow the trumpet, gather together, and repent. Return to the ways of Yahweh laid out before us. 
return to the observance of his word. I think that's what he's saying here. If you look in verse 28 and 29, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Sounds like Pentecost to me. Sounds like a glimpse into the future of, of Yahweh's mission, Yahweh's objective. And I don't think I've ever really thought about that from Joel before. You know, I think of Joel, I think of locusts. That's, all, that's it. But there's so much more here. If you, if you read that, it's talking about Pentecost. In verse uh, 32, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of Yahweh will be delivered. For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as Yahweh has said, and the remnant of whom Yahweh shall call. I think that this, this part right here, this, this verse, verse 32, is extremely important for a couple different reasons. Whosoever shall call upon the name of Yahweh shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as Yahweh has said, and the remnant whom Yahweh shall call. You have to return to his ways. This is commandments. That is, that is what we're told to do, is return to his ways. You're supposed to call on his name. Whoever shall call on the name of Yahweh shall be saved and be part of that remnant. So you have the commandments, you have Yahweh's name, and you have being part of the remnant or the first fruits. There's so much that you could say about this, about this, just this alone, because this encompasses almost everything we stand for at YRM. The commandments, the, the word, his ways, his name, and to be part of the remnant, to be part of the first fruits. We're big on the first fruits here. We think that that's an important picture painted throughout the scriptures, and I think this is just one of the many proofs of that. So, so far we have the judgments of Yahweh's armies in chapter 1. And in chapter 2, we have the conclusion of this onslaught, this destruction and return of Yahweh's people to his way in the second part of the chapter. So chapter 3. I knew I had a slide for this. I forgot all about it. Return to his ways, call on his name, answer the call of the remnant. That's the first fruits. Would have been a lot better if I got it back then. So chapter 3, judgment and Jehoshaphat. I thought that was pretty, pretty good. <laughs> Chapter 3 starts with Yahweh pleading with the nations to return his people to their rightful place in the valley of Jehoshaphat under the threat of their own people being scattered if Israel is not returned to Yahweh. Let's go ahead and read chapter 3. Um, I'll read down until I recognize where I'm at. Okay, chapter, chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, in the days, in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of, captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, for whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people, and have given a, a boy for a harlot, and sold the girl for wine that they may drink. Yea, what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, I will return your recompense upon your own head. Because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly, pleasant things. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians that ye may remove them far from their border. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them and return them your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah. And they shall sell them to the Sabians with the people far off for Yahweh hath spoken it. I think that the, 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 I find this extremely interesting. Yahweh isn't coming and just demanding. He's not saying, do this now or else. Well, he says or else, but he says, do this now. He's, he's asking nicely the first time around. I find that fascinating. He's asking nicely. He's pleading with these nations. Don't, essentially, don't make me do this. And I have a feeling, I have a feeling I think we know, all know where this is going with these other nations. So rarely do people actually do what Yahweh asks them to do. Life would be so much easier for all of us if we just did it. Interestingly enough, in verse um, 9 and 10, 
will continue to read, proclaim this among the Gentiles, prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near and let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears and let the weak say, I am strong. This is interesting because this is the reverse of the order given in Isaiah. I'm not sure what the significance of that is just yet, but I find it interesting over in Isaiah chapter 2, over in Isaiah chapter 2, we've got, um, and he shall judge among the nations and rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn the ways of war anymore. Isaiah 2, 4. And then you have Joel describing this judgment. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. I, I, again, I find that just an interesting parallel there between Isaiah and Joel. Now, I could go on and on and on. It's a short book, mind you. It's a short book. Chapter th three chapters you can get through in about 10 minutes. And you could spend hours on just one chapter if you, really, if, if you really wanted to dig in. And I recommend that you do because I believe there's a lot out of these books that we overlook so, so often. I wanted to give a spotlight to such a short book. And it's this, the first of many that I will cover. And, I, and I, I know it's short, and it has been short, and I apologize for that. But I've already done Hosea, and I plan on doing more. And who among us knew that Blow the Trumpet in Zion was about locusts? Never really thought about it, have you? Nope, I didn't either. And I don't, I, don't want, I don't want to discourage anybody from jumping into these books. There's a lot here. There's a lot to take in. But there's a lot to, to glean from it, for not just for ancient Israel, not just for a history lesson, but for a future lesson. Because the day of Yahweh will come, and the Messiah will return, and all of these things will happen, and we need to make ourselves ready, as Scripture tells us. There's so much that we can do, there's so much more that we can do, there's so much more that we should do for each other, for those out in the world that are seeking the truth. You don't want to, you don't want to have... Um, the people you love and the people you care about caught up in that judgment. Whoops, look at that. I had more slides than I thought again. <laughs> I apologize for the, short, for the short length of this message. It was, it was, I've been struggling with sickness and music and everything else. And so praise Yahweh for the time that I was given. I pray that it was a blessing and I pray that everybody benefits from it. Praise Yahweh and thank you so much. Hey, Lucas here at the Wire and Production Studios. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking the logo over on the right. Also, ring that bell icon so that you're notified every time we upload a new teaching. And lastly, don't forget to download the YRM mobile app. It's free and full of content. If you love the Bible like we do, you won't want to miss it. And as always, thank you so much for watching.